Well, this morning we are going to take a one week break from our study in Titus. And we're going to look at an attribute of God. And it's, uh, I think it's vital that we spend a great amount of time, copious amounts of time, understanding the character, the nature of God. And so we're going to be looking at just one attribute. We find it in Psalm 139. Psalm 139. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through 12. Here David writes in verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day. For darkness is as light with you. Pray with me. Lord, we have just heard your inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. We ask that we would receive it as such. We ask that you would help us to see you more clearly, to understand the nature of our great God. Help us now, we pray. Amen. Do you ever feel like you can't escape the ever watchful eye of Big Brother? From that mini computer that's in your pocket, that's able to pinpoint your location, GPS track you, to the myriad of cameras that we find on streets, on buildings, and banks, in stores, in churches, we cannot escape the ever-present, all-seeing eye of technology surveillance. But as, as intrusive as technology is, it pales into comparison to our God. You see, our God is everywhere present and is everywhere seen at all times. God is the only being, the only being in the truest sense that is everywhere, always, seen, always. Now we call this attribute the om omnipresence of God. The omnipresence of God. Uh, the word omni attached there is, comes from the Latin and just means all. So our God is all present. All present. A more full definition for his omnipresence is this. God fills every part of space with his entire being at all times and by implication sees everything in all places at the same time. Now let me unpack that fuller definition for you. Omnipresence of God is a characteristic, a characteristic of him being present to all extents of both space and time and outside space and time, gazing on all that there is and all that there is not. Although God is present in all space and time, God is not locally confined or limited in any, any way to time and space. God is everywhere and is in every now, and is in every possible now, including if there was no now. No molecule, no atom, no atomic particle is too small that God is not in it, that he is not there filling it. And no galaxy is so vast, so large, that God does not invade it, filling it with his presence. 
It should be noted that omnipresence, this word, we don't find it in scripture. It's an extra biblical word that we, we give language to, we put to the characteristic of God. But omnipresence is clearly taught in the scripture. Listen to how the word of God defines omnipresence. Jeremiah 23, 24, the prophet says, Can anyone hide himself in secret places so that I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. Proverbs 15, 3 Solomon writes, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Job 34, 21, Job declares, for his eyes are upon the ways of a man, and he sees all of his steps. And finally, in 1 Kings 8, 27, the writer says, behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, Lord. God is everywhere in the universe. He sees all, all of his creatures, all of his creation, all at the same time. There is not a square inch that he is not. Now with that being said, I want us to understand from this text that our main point is this, this morning. There is nowhere in creation to escape the presence of God. There is nowhere in creation to escape the presence of God. Now, before we look at this passage in some more detail this morning, I want to clear up a misunderstanding, a false teaching about God. It's a teaching that's been around that still rears its ugly head from time to time. To some, God being omnipresent is the teaching that God is in all things. This is the idea that God is in everything and God is everything. For example, I could say God is here in this building. Or they would say that God is the building. This teaching is called pantheism. It's been around for millennia. Pantheism is a teaching that just literally means that God is all. This idea is illustrated often. We see it in movies. For instance, for all you parents, grandparents, if you've been stuck watching that Disney movie Pocahontas, you see it presented, pantheism is presented in that movie. You have the majestic grandmother Willow. And she is portrayed as God. And not only the tree, but the sky is God. The sea is God. And so God is found in the tree, in the sky, in the sea. Simply, if you just become attuned to those things in nature, you become attuned to God. Maybe for some of us, Science fiction fans, the film series Star Wars, we see pantheism in this movie as well. The force that is in the movie, the force is this almost deified energy, this thing that is there. And this force is what propels and causes people to come. It is this Christ or this God-like presence in the universe, which consequently makes the universe the God-like force. See, this notion that because God is everywhere present does not mean that he is in everything. He is not this building. He is not the tree because God is outside his creation. God is distinct from it. He is totally other from his creation. Of course, this error of thinking that God is being seen, or that he is bound to his creation, that he is part of his creation, well, this is not a proper understanding of our God. This is not a proper understanding of the omnipresence of God. God as creator is utterly separate. He is entirely other Anything that says something different than that 
is the sin of worshiping the creature rather than the creator, according to the Apostle Paul. Well, let's look at the first point. It's found in verse 7. The first point is this, David's recognition. Now, I kind of started here in the middle of the song. But here, under the divine inspiration of the Spirit, David asks a rhetorical question. It's a question that has an obvious answer, but it's a question that has to be recognized. David says, where shall I go from your spirit, or where, where shall I flee from your presence? Now that question there, this will serve as the overarching goal or theme or main idea of David's poem for the next five verses. Where shall I go? Where shall I flee from your presence? And as I said, this is a rhetorical question. So the obvious answer is nowhere. There is nowhere that I can flee. There is nowhere that I can go. There is nowhere that I can hide from your Holy Spirit. Quick plug for all of your Jehovah's Witnesses friends. The Holy Spirit is God. Where can I flee from your spirit? Oh yeah, it's in the scripture. So point them to the Bible. But as I said, the answer is obvious. There is nowhere. David recognizes this. He affirms that there is nowhere that he can flee from the spirit of God. David is communicating that God is being everywhere, present in creation, implying that God sees all, everywhere, all the time, in every way. And so, it is futility to try and to hide from God. Like Adam in the garden, when he sinned, he tried to hide from God. Or like Jonah, when he was told to go to Nineveh, he tried to flee from God. In both cases, they were found because God is everywhere present, seeing all. When you think of God, I couldn't help but draw this conclusion, this illustration. When you think of God's ubiquity, his omnipresence, it's like looking at a portrait, the portrait of Mona Lisa, if you've ever seen that or a copy of that. No matter where you go as you're staring at that portrait, her eyes follow you. No matter how far you go to the left or to the right and try to get out of the view of those eyes, they seamlessly just they follow you. Well, God is like that in his omnipresence. He follows, he sees. God's stare is inescapable. There is nowhere in creation to escape from God. Now this verse, it has implications for all of us. God's omnipresence provokes in him a desire. It provokes in him a desire to care for his creation. To care for the universe and to care for us. Because he's everywhere present and he sees all, he feeds the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the beasts of the field, the animals on the mountaintop. He feeds them all. He cares for them all so that we can eat. You ever think about it like that? Or because he is omnipresent, he sends forth the rain, sends forth dew, snow, the moisture to water the earth, to care for the earth, so that it will yield crops, so that men can rule over the earth, have dominion, so that we can have a livelihood. It's all connected to his omnipresence. But the greatest gift due to his ubiquity, his presence, is this, that he sent a savior into the world to redeem us from sin, death, and hell. I want you to think about this for just a second. I want you to make it personal for you. 
God who is transcendent, who is other, who is outside space and time. God who is separate and distinct from creation. This same God, because of a desire in him to care, stepped down into history for you. He stooped down, condescended, literally came down on one knee for you. Because he desires to care for you because he sees you. Our God sent Emmanuel into creation. In case you don't know, Emmanuel means God with us. Our omnipresent God is always with us. In the person of Jesus Christ, our Emmanuel, God with us. And he did that for you. He did that for you. Well, this takes us to our next point in verses 8 through 10. And this is where we see David's awe. David's awe. There's a reverence. There's a, there's a response that takes place to this question. Where can I flee from your presence? Where can I go from your spirit? Well, verses 8 through 10 we're going to see the awe-inspired answer. Now, David's going to use a literary device, a device that's common to Hebrew poetry. It's called mirisms, a mirism. Let me try and explain what that is. A mirism is when you take two words of contrasting parts of the whole. Two words of the contrasting parts of the whole but when you put them together, it describes the whole. For example, we have the phrase, I search high and low. Those two words, high and low, are two contrasting words, and when put together, complete the whole. High and low means we look everywhere to the highest, to the lowest, and everything in between. Well, this is what David is going to be employing here. This is the device that he employs throughout this poem in this section, is extremes, polar opposites, contrast, to, to show us just how present God really is and how there is no escaping him. Verse 8 says, If I ascend to heaven, you are there. David exclaims here, if I ascend to the highest heaven, if I could go up, up, up to the most northern, furthest outer space, if you will, if I could do that, God, you are there. You're already there. Conversely, he continues, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. David is contemplating the lowest low. Sheol is the Old Testament word for the place of the grave, the place of the dead. Sometimes it refers to paradise, which we call heaven, and sometimes it refers to hell. Well, in David's case, he's referring to the lowest of low, which would be paradise for him. The context determines it. So in other words, David is saying, if I could go down to the deepest deep, the most southern point of anything, you were there. You were there. God's presence is in the highest high and the lowest of low. He is in everything in between. That is a mirrorism. But he continues, really in amazement, verse 9, by stating this. If I take the wings of the morning. David is talking about the sun rising here. He's talking about when the sun comes up before you see that giant glowing ball. 
the very rays that emanate off of it. Those are the wings. The wings of the morning. And he's saying, if I could go to that place where the wings originate, where they take up and they make flight across the sky, if I could go there, that most eastern point, you were there. You're already there. He continues, if I could dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, meaning if I could go to the farthest western edge of the world, beyond the Mediterranean Sea, if I could go there, you are there. Even there is where you're at, God. It reminds me of the story of the little boy that was coming from his little Sunday school class. And an older man came up to him and tried to trick him. He says, I'll give you a dollar to tell me where God is. And the little boy took the dollar and says, I'll give you a dollar if you can tell me where God isn't. <laughs> That's the point. This is what David is getting to. Contrast and extremes and everything in between. There is nowhere that God is not. Now, if you allow me some bad English, I put it like this. If I were to go to the northernest north, or the most southernest south, or the most easternest east, or the most westernest west. You are there, God. You feel it. You see all things there. There is nowhere to hide. There is nowhere to escape. Even there, God, you are present, leading me. You are present, leading me. This picture of leading me, it, Hebrew means that he seizes David's hand. He grabs his hand, he leads it, he grasps his hand in a seizing manner. David's stricken with awe here. As great and as immense as God is, that God reaches down and takes his hand. He holds it. It's ever present with him. You know, think about what David's getting at. This is the picture of a father who holds a child's hand. He clutches the child's hand. He holds it in such a way to take him through life, to take him across the perils of danger, to lead him in such a way that he will never, ever let him go. Holds him. Now, what can we learn from David's recognition of God's omnipresence here? What, what can we learn? Well, there's several things, but I just want to give you two. Two things. First thing is this that for the Christian, God's omnipresence brings comfort. It brings comfort. What do I mean by that? Think about your life as a believer. You were lied about. You were lied about by friends, by family. You were slandered at work. You were slandered by coworkers, by bosses. You have people who continuously bring you harm. They continuously do injustices to you. They abuse you verbally, physically, sexually and yet because God is omnipresent it brings us comfort why because God sees the evildoer God sees the injustice that is being done to you he sees the hatred he sees the scorn he sees how they detest you because they detested his son. And God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. No, we don't take comfort in the fact that people have vengeance brought against him by the Lord God. 
but we take comfort in the fact that God sees us in our hurts. He sees us in our injustices. God is there and he is saying, let this be a comfort, comfort to you. No one's getting away with anything. No one. I see it all. I remember it all. And in that day, I will pay back. I will recompense accordingly. The second way that we see God's omnipresence is this. For unbelievers. For unbelievers. God's omnipresence should be a terror for you. It should be an absolute terror to you. I want to go back where David said, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there, God. Now remember, context determines the understanding of that word. For David, it's paradise. It's heaven. But for the unbeliever, it's hell. It's eternal fire. It's judgment. Have you heard the teaching that in hell, you are separated from God? Have you been taught that? Have you been taught that when people go to hell, God removes himself, that he is no longer in the presence of the sinner? It's nonsense. Complete nonsense. See, for God to remove himself from anywhere in creation would make him not God. Now, God is filling the universe. He is everywhere, all seen. You see, what makes hell a terror is not the fire, it's not the torment, it's not the pain, it's not the thick blackness, it's not the intense, panic-stricken loneliness. It's not those things. What makes hell truly terrible is the presence of God. The presence of God. See, if you're an unbeliever, there is no party in hell. There is no meeting back up of old acquaintances. No, there in hell, you will feel the active gaze of God on you. God is ever present in hell, judging the sinner, banishing the sinner, and exacting holy justice on the sinner. He is not absent. He feels more real there than anywhere. For the sinner in hell, he will cry out under the gaze of God, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Because our God is a consuming fire. And it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So, the omnipresence of God should be terror to the unbeliever. To those who will not repent of their sins and trust Christ alone for salvation. It is a holy terror because there is no escape for creation from God. And this leads us to our last point, verses 11 through 12. David's exposure. David's exposure. Verses 11 and 12 say this. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, the night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. David concludes this, that darkness cannot conceal him from God's gaze. There is nowhere black enough that he can hide from God. He cannot have a blanket that provides him co cover. There is not a protective barrier that will cover him. There is no veil that he can throw over himself where God cannot see. 
It's because God's omnipresence necessitates sight. God must see since he is everywhere. He must penetrate all places. David is exposed in God's sight. It's as if he's laying bare and naked before the God. He concludes that there is nowhere that night and light make no difference to you, God. It is the same. You penetrate both and see through it all. The writer of Hebrews affirms this kind of exposure by saying that there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. Nothing and no one can evade the Lord's sight. Nothing, no one. Well, think of it this way, beloved. When we sin, and we do, God sees us doing that. He sees us in our sins, no matter where we're at on the globe. Nothing is hidden from his sight. Our sins are as naked and open to him as David feels right now. Sin is always, always exposed to God. God's omnipresent demands it to be so. It demands it. But our sins, though visible to God are not counted against us. They're not counted against us. We do not need to cower and hide like Adam did. We do not need to run because we have a sin bearer. We have one who took our sin. Matthew 27, verses 46 and 47 tells us this, that the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. The scene is Christ in his passion hanging there on the cross. And this thick blackness covers the land. God is showing up, as it were, on the scene. He is making his presence manifest. He has always been there. But he is showing the world his hot displeasure. For sin. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's in this moment that Jesus is feeling the gaze of God. The, the same gaze the sinner in hell feels, he is feeling. He is there exposed to the wrath of God. He is hanging naked and wide open for all to see and especially God. In that moment, Jesus knew he could not escape from God. No matter where he was, no matter how thick the darkness, it was there at the cross that Jesus is exposed by the omnipresence of the Lord. Because there is nowhere in creation to escape the presence of God. A terrifying aspect of God's omnipresence is this. The shame of sins we commit is there and present. But the glorious reality that in Christ, that shame of those sins has now been removed by Christ's work. In Jesus Christ, shame has been done away with positionally. We have no shame before God because he who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for us. And so we don't feel that exposure. We don't know that exposure. We don't live in that exposure in the same way that a sinner does who does not know the Lord. From Christ's terror, his people, us, his people, receive unimaginable comfort instead of uncomfortable shame. So when we sin, and we do, 
and we feel the shame of it, know that the sin bearer died and rose again to take that shame. That certainly doesn't absolve us from the responsibility of it or the death that it brings, but we are forever covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our sins have been hidden in Jesus Christ's exposure, and he simply says, go and sin no more. David, in his exposure, cannot help but come to grips with the omnipresence of God. He cannot help but come to terms with the fact that that there is nowhere that he can flee his spirit. There is nowhere he can hide from him. Because there is nowhere in creation that anyone can escape the presence of God. Now, I want to conclude with this. This is a, a heavy subject, right? Anytime that you talk about the attributes of God, you're talking about God. And I'm scratching the surface here. But I believe he calls each and every one of us to respond to him. To respond to what he has said. To respond, whether it's in the negative, meaning we are not believers. And so we need to become that so we don't fall under the gaze of God. Or respond in the positive. We are believers, but understanding that Christ has died to take our shame and that we have one who stands in place for us. Both of these are realities. One is glorious and one is tragic. 